Hello there, everyone. Welcome to Perspectives of Change. At Perspectives of Change, we are dedicated to exploring how to not change forward by understanding and valuing multiple perspectives. I'm your host, Sarika Kharbanda. And today we have an amazing topic, which we call Beyond, oh, Thinking Beyond 9 to 5, Unlocking Potential with Async. And for bringing amazing insights to this topic, we have a very, very, very special guest today with us, Sumit Gayatri Moge, who's dialing in from the same city that I am in, which is awesome. Hey, Sumit. Hey, Sarika. Thanks for having me. So excited to have you here and unpack a little more on this topic. But before we start doing that, Sumit, it would be fantastic if you could, you know, uh, give us a quick introduction of yourself. Yeah, sure. Look, I'm I'm probably more of a practitioner than anything else. So I, in my day job, work as a product manager. And uh, in most companies, that's the person who looks at a business problem that needs to get solved, builds a hypothesis to solve it, tests out potential solution, and then bridges the gap between the development team and the business and the customers to try and get it out, right? So that's my job. Um, and yeah, I'm a consultant with a company called ThoughtWorks and that apart, uh, in my free time, I'm a photographer and I focus mostly on nature and wildlife photography. Awesome. Photography. Okay. I'm, I'm going to probably ask for some tips later. <laughs> that sure, helps. sure. Yeah. And did you also want to share something about this amazing book that you've actually written? Just a few words on that. Yeah, yeah. I'm the author of this book called The Async First Playbook. And as the name suggests, uh, it advocates for taking all collaboration uh, on a spectrum and saying we will start asynchronously and then move to synchronous methods if necessary. And of course, we need to probably unpack what async and sync means. And we can do that as part of this conversation. Awesome. Uh, but just maybe one other question on your book itself. Would this be for a specific audience, if you could just tell us that? Yeah. So uh, interestingly enough, uh, most of the book is broadly relevant. So anyone who's doing any kind of knowledge work in any level of distribution should be able to pick up the book and get some value out of it. But it's most valuable to teams that are building software because when you get to the playbook section of the book, the practices that the book addresses are practices that software development teams usually find themselves doing. And then also, if you had to get very specific with those practices, it's teams that have some familiarity with Agile. And that is pretty much every team these days. So they do sprints, they do stand-ups, they do sprint planning and stuff like that, right? And so I go into the specifics of those practices and talk about how they might be more remote first, but then from remote first to also async first. Right. Oh, that is that is amazing because yes, you're right. It's not just the software teams today that are agile. I mean, I work with teams in HR and marketing in finance and name it. And, you know, a lot of these teams are going agile, but right. yeah. So for all our viewers and listeners, do remember to grab a copy. I have just started the first chapter already of Sumit's book, and we will bring Sumit back perhaps on a book interview. If you'd like to, Sumit, I'd be mm -hmm. delighted to bring you back. Of course, of course. I, I'm looking forward to it already. Awesome. So today, of course, we're going to go a little broad on this topic. It's not going to be focused on the book, as you heard us. We are going to dive and unpack async for pretty much anybody out here. And I would hope uh, we could start with uh, Sumit by unpacking async from a couple of perspectives, right? Um, thinking of it from, let's say, a team perspective and perhaps even a leadership perspective, and I don't know, maybe a system and an organizational perspective. Mm -hmm. Sure, sure. So where would you like to start? Let's start with the teams. Yeah. So look, there is, uh, there is a little bit of history that we need to be aware of, right? If you take away 
the world and just start to divide it into three parts. So there is before the pandemic, during the pandemic, and then post pandemic. There are uh, three different systems of working that we've adopted, right? So the system of work before the pandemic was mostly in office. Mm -hmm. For most people, with a few exceptions thrown in. And during the pandemic, it was forced remote. Whether you liked it or not, you were remote, right? And now the world is hybrid. Every individual may not be hybrid. What does that mean? It means that you might have some people who sit in an office in the same team, and there might be some people who are working from home or a third place, like a client office or a cafe or whatever, right? And when you start to expand that heterogeneity across the whole working class, then that's a very heterogeneous setup that we are living in today, which is far different from what it used to be pre-pandemic. Mm -hmm. But there's a baggage that we carry from our pre-pandemic days where everyone used to be in the office and uh, a lot of agile practices tend to recommend that people sit around the same table. You can just tap somebody on the shoulder and get an answer and, you know, there you go, right? right. And open plan offices have been advocated for, for a long time. So we've held these up as the paragon of collaboration and teams. But the evidence has always been to the contrary. So if you go back and look at the evidence for our open app, plan offices really productive, you will see, no, they aren't, right? Mm -hmm. they're, they're actually highly unproductive. Is it really a good idea to tap somebody on the shoulder and get an immediate answer? No, you're breaking their flow. You're actually reducing their productivity. There's research that says, research from Gloria Mark, which our listeners can look at, which says that it takes 23 minutes to recover from every interruption that you go through. Because it's not just one interruption, tap on the shoulder and then I'm back. Yeah. It's once you get interrupted, you get into a sub interruption and another sub interruption. So before you get out of those nested interruptions and go back to what you were doing, it's often 20 odd minutes, yeah. right? And take 10 interruptions in the day, that's 200 minutes lost of productivity, right? So the office model expects synchrony, people to be in the same place at the same time. When you transplant that mindset into a distributed model, which is what we are today, and we were during the remote, uh, the forced remote days of the pandemic as well, it means that you're constantly on Zoom or mm -hmm. constantly on Team. Or worse, you're trying to have a real-time conversation while typing on Slack, mm. right? And what that means is you have an incredibly interrupted day which is not productive, it's, it doesn't even make you feel happy. You're not doing any deep work, right? And that's the big problem to solve. But the, there are a couple of other things to consider, right? Uh, so there is deep work, there is that interruption that you want to reduce. But when you have to actually be in the same virtual or physical space at the same time, you're precluding certain people from being part of the team. So for example, let us say I'm a mother, with a disproportionate share of parenting and household responsibilities, I need that flexibility to be able to work at my own pace and during my own time. So synchrony has a significant impact on diversity and inclusion in teams, right? The fact that I can work at my own time allows me work-life balance as well, right? Uh, if you don't always reach for a meeting, then you're going to have to look at slower means of communication. Often that is writing. Mm. That helps build knowledge in the team. And writing scales easily, right? Instead of me having the same conversation with five other team members, I can write a document once and then it goes to everyone. So yeah. you optimize for scale as well. And then if I'm able to work relatively independently and the team trusts me to do that, or maybe even if I'm not working independently, we're working in pairs, right? Mm -hmm. In those kind of scenarios, you are almost forcing yourself to make decisions because now it's not okay to go interrupt somebody saying, hey, let's make this decision together. You make the decision because you're owning that piece of work, however small. And that also creates that bias for action. So there are a lot of benefits to taking an approach which is deviating from that baggage of the office where we expect people to be in the same place, virtual or physical at the same time. And we say, no, there are some things that we can do in our own time 
asynchronously. We don't need to be in the same physical or virtual space at the same time. A lot of reality that you've just shared, and this is this is what I'm also seeing happening in a lot of companies, right? I mean, yeah. not working remote for the first time. This has been like, I don't know. I've been working remote, I think, since 99, as far as right. I remember, and right. or distributed, uh, to yeah. be more precise. Um, and it's it's amazing how we are learning only now from pre-pandemic, and we needed a pandemic to tell us that you know work can be done differently, and different types of inclusivity can happen if we work slightly differently, say post-pandemic. But let me just nudge on with another question in this context. Of course, we're talking of everybody in an organization, mm -hmm. including all levels, right, to, to your response just now. What role might leadership have to play in this? Would it be more, because we're not seeing a lot of this happening in organizations, you know, is, is leadership really the one who has to enable this? Or what's your perspective on that? How, how can we enable more of async from a leadership level for them and for the rest of the organization? Maybe it's multifold questions. Yeah, there are a number of layers to unpack there. So firstly, you know, we need to re-examine what leadership means. Mm -hmm. So is a lot of leadership literature, which you look at, you must have read it as well. There is this concept of management by look, walking around and looking, mm -hmm. okay? Which means then, of course, everyone needs to be in the office because you can't do management by walking around and looking. And if you expect to do that in a virtual setup, then the equivalent of walking around and looking is to see people always present on chat and always present on Zoom calls, yeah. right? But I mean, as I say in the book, there's gotta be a better way to work because uh, we have the tech to be able to figure out what outcomes and outputs people are driving towards and measure them based on that as against our snap judgments when we walk around and look mm. right so so there's a mindset shift of course right uh, which is to say how do we put in systems that help me figure out what people's contributions are and how is the team driving towards an outcome that makes sense for whichever business we serve? Right. Mm -hmm. And the leader's job is to enable those systems. And we can get into examples of those systems. So that's one part of it. Now, if I'm not spending all of my time walking around and looking, then what am I spending my time in? My, I'm spending my time hands on in service of the team, creating systems that take away the drudge work. What is the kind of drudge work that I'm talking about? The drudge work is stuff like, I report to the manager every day what I've done. Or I come on a stand up and I have to say, here's what I did yesterday, here's what I'm doing today, here's what's blocking me. Well, that information should always be available in real time, transparently. I shouldn't have to wait for a stand up to broadcast that information, right? So what is the manager doing to you know, facilitate that transparent uh, sharing of information, right? And then, uh, you know, what am I doing to make everyone's life easy? For example, either by ensuring that reporting gets automated or by ensuring that, you know, I don't have to make an, a manual update to Jira. The moment I commit code in, let's say, Bitbucket or Git, it automatically triggers an update to Jira which ensures that everyone is aware of what is happening with that ticket, right? So that's that's a leader's job. And of course, that doesn't have to be one leader's job. It's, it's the job of probably multiple leads on a team, but that's the shift that you're in service of the team. And then there's a third shift, right? Uh, the moment you start saying that we are moving from presence-based ways of working, which is Zoom and Slack all the time, Mm -hmm. then obviously uh, it's, a, it's a shift. You're changing your ways of working to a different model. And this is almost a certainty. The moment you change your ways of working, there will be a short-term impact on productivity. Sure, sure. All right. If it doesn't happen, great. You can pat yourself on the back and go and give yourself your favorite beverage as a treat. But most likely it's going to happen. So getting, getting business buy-in, to be able to absorb that impact is your responsibility as a leader, mm -hmm. right? And then 
once you have business buy-in, then you can't just all of a sudden one day say, oh, all right, meetings, we don't do that anymore. Mm -hmm. Because your team's been following a set of practices, right? Every single day. What do they do? Do they just drop them like hot potatoes and move on? You've got to be able to move through a shift where you say, all right, stand-ups, here's how we can do them better. Sprint planning, here's how we can do it better. Prioritization, here's how we can do them better. Retros, here's how we can do them better, right? So you've got to go practice by practice. You can't drop all your practices like hot potatoes. So that's the responsibility, at least at the middle management and leadership level. Uh, and that's generally the way I think about it. Well, that's awesome. And it's perfect because I think that's the role that we see for the future leaders anyways in the modern era because you need to really manage the whole system, right, for your teams to be productive. And and that's what that's what you should just all keep doing. And I don't know, it's it's taking a while for me to also bring that shift with leaders that I work with because it's still about managing the people. And no matter how much we stress on the fact that you have to manage the system and in, in this amazing examples that you gave, I mean, why should you not know even before a stand-up meeting what are the challenges that I'm facing or my pair is facing while working on this piece of code or whatever, right? So yeah. it's really yeah. simple, make it transparent, make it visible in some way, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Interesting. So uh, let me uh, follow that up with another question. What's the kind of resistance that you are seeing or the pushback? Maybe maybe resistance is a negative word for many, so I'm not going to use it. It's still a positive word for me because I love resistance. Always gives me feedback. But let's let's put it as pushback. What's the pushback that you're getting from people that why should they not go async? Or, or would it be better, uh, Sumit, maybe I should ask you this question before. Is this async for everybody? I know we touched a little upon that in your introduction, but you want to tell yeah. us? About so let's let's uh, dive one level deep and say what do we mean by async? Mm -hmm. It means meetings are not the first option; they are the last resort. Okay. Now, traditional work means if I need. If I believe I have a need to collaborate with Sarika, the first thing I'm going to do is set up a meeting. That's traditional work. Yeah. But the first principle of async is meetings are the last resort. Okay, so now if meetings are the last resort, then, well, what do you do? Writing becomes a first-class citizen when it comes to communication in a team. All right? And if writing is a first-class citizen when it comes to communication, writing doesn't appear from nowhere unless you're using, using something like ChatGPT, which will be incredibly generic. The work that you usually do on your team is highly custom. Hmm. So if you have to create writing and somebody else has to consume writing, there will naturally be some lag. And so the team needs to be comfortable with that reasonable lag. So those are the three principles, right? Principle one is meetings are the last resort. Principle two is writing is a first class means of communication. And principle three is everyone should be comfortable with reasonable lag. What that reasonable lag is, the team defines. So for example, if somebody sends me an email, how soon should I respond? If I see it, if there's a chat message, how long does it take to get a response? What is the medium that we use for urgent communication? So on and so forth, right? So, so that's one part of it. Now. For an individual to be able to participate in a team like this, there are some skills that are non-negotiable. Skill number one, you should be able to write because writing is a primary means of communication. Skill number two, you should be able to read. If you've lost the reading habit, you will have to build that reading habit because there's no point in people writing if nobody will read it. True. Right? True. Uh, and there are ways of building that reading habit. So uh, I understand that a lot of people have lost that reading habit. So how do you build that reading habit? Either you put in some practices in your own time where you devote certain time every day, 10 minutes every day to read something substantial and make sense of it. And gradually you'll build back that reading muscle. Let's say there is a document people have to study before a meeting. You're noticing people are not studying the document. Set aside the first 15 min minutes, the first 15 minutes of a meeting for people to consume that document in silence. Very soon, you'll nudge people in the direction of read first, come to the meeting next. Mm. Right? Mm. So that's how you build up the habit of reading. So writing, reading. The third is to be able to block distractions. 
Now, there's no point in having your calendar empty and free of meetings if you're command tabbing to Facebook, LinkedIn, chat, and everything else. You should have the ability to just zone out all those distractions and be able to work on whatever you have at hand, right? And the fifth is to be able to work and learn independently, which means then if I have to take a decision, I own it. I can record it for everyone's benefit so they know the rationale. I know what it takes to backtrack from that decision. If I have to learn something, I'm able to at least make an attempt to learn it. Even if I face an intractable problem, you follow the principle of async first. Write up what the problem is. Describe where you got to. That will help the other person understand your thinking, right? And sometimes the act of writing up the problem makes the solution clear for you, right? So is async for everyone? It's for people who can demonstrate these four skills, reading, writing, working independently, and working without distractions. Awesome. And I think I'm also going to say meetings being the last resort is going to be such a tough mindset to shift for so many people. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, absolutely. And in fact, that's that's one of the one of the things that throws people off. And I don't like diluting that concept because, uh, see, one of the things is to put a hard line in the sand, right? And say, it's still a line in the sand, but it's a deep goddamn line, right? So, so now you know that if you've got to cross it, you're going to have to cross it with some conscious thought. The moment you say, oh, but no, meetings can also happen, you cannot, then you're diluting your point. So async first is not async only. It just means that you prefer asynchronous communication over synchronous. Right. And wherever possible, you start asynchronous and go to synchronous only when it's absolutely necessary. Right. Yeah, makes sense. You also reminded me of, uh, I remember a couple of organizations that started putting posts on LinkedIn uh, for the past couple of years or so. Oh, Wednesday free meetings, and they called it things, right? And then there was a post that came up, it said, so because I know that they have Wednesday free meetings, so, so no meetings any Wednesday, right? And I could definitely find time in their calendar to book a meeting. I was like, what's the point? You've lost the whole point of it, right? You're looking for a free day, a meeting free day. Yeah. And yeah, but then people also yeah. started giving in. And I was like, that's not working. If you've decided yeah. it's meeting free day, keep it that way. Yeah, you make an interesting point because, see, um, I, I think that's a fantastic practice of yes. keeping certain days meeting free, but they've got to be blocked out on the calendar because exactly. if they're open, if they're like open season slots, then everyone's going to take them. So uh, as a forcing function on some of my teams, here's what we've done. We've yeah. said the mornings are meeting free because our minds are fresh and we can devote them to deep work. All our meetings move to the second half of the day. Nice. So Monday to Thursday, mornings are meeting free. And we do an extra, which is Fridays for focus. So Fridays are also meeting free. What that does is that you get to end the week with a sense of accomplishment because now you're getting a good eight hours for deep work, right? Uh, and you feel like you got something done. And what we do alongside is we block the team calendar and our personal calendars saying nobody can create meetings in these kind of slots. Of course, if there's an emergency, we'll handle it. Now, actually, it's not too bad, right? Because if you if you look at it, it leaves 16 hours every week open for meetings. That's True. a lot of time for meetings. Yeah. Elite teams can get away with less than four hours per person. Mm. Right. So you're giving 4x the amount of time for meetings. But this is where leadership comes in, because let's say your team blocks off their time and your boss comes in, you know, admonishes the team saying, oh, it seems like you're having a really good time blocking off time and you're not available for meetings. I mean, you're not creating much safety there, right? So you've got to protect your team from any external influences during that time. And you've got to radiate that information that this time for my team is meeting free. Yeah. And that's the job of the leader to protect the team from unwanted influences. Which means they need to be on board with this mindset even before, you know, it gets to the team. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And think about it from the leader's perspective as well. As against having to do 
the job of a glorified coordinator, yeah, which I'm sure in some time is going to be outsourceable to AI, you can get into doing deep work. So if you're a tech lead, you can start getting into you know, deep architectural decisions. You can start doing code reviews during this time, right? If you are, let's say, a product manager, you're able to dive into the details of defining a next hypothesis. What's the prototype you're creating to, you know, test out that hypothesis? What are the questions you're going to ask when you do an interview based on that prototype? You can get into a lot of deep work. So for all leadership roles, you're freeing up time, which you would have otherwise spent in coordination activities into trying to do deep work. Yeah, I like the fact that, you know, as leaders, if we can get more time, I would say, yeah, you can actually even go ahead, write 10 books, lots yeah. of articles, posts, everything, everything that you wanted to do, even to accomplish a lot at the end of that week or yeah, some goals that you've brought in. I would also think this moves leaders in the direction of managing more of the system now because you're, you're now protecting your team, yes, but you're also setting them up for success to make them as elite as possible, right? Elite performing teams don't happen by accident. You have to be intentional, right? So this is one intentionality that they can put in place for them. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if you look at some of the most well-oiled teams that are out there, outside the realm of knowledge work and software and all of that, I mean, think about the racetrack at the Grand Prix or Le Mans or any of these places. There's a very well-oiled process. The You see the heroism of the driver who's driving around the racetrack, but you don't necessarily see the heroism of the process that's been put in place for the driver to drive at that speed. Yeah. So the driver comes at the pit stop, stops for barely a few seconds, and the process is so well-oiled that the vehicle gets serviced, the driver gets refreshed, and he's back in his saddle to do another round of the circuit, right? And so great leaders will manage the process and the system and stop, you know, micromanaging people instead. Very true, very true. So with that, I'm going to lead into another question because you had an amazing point in your blog and I'm going to, you know, literally pull that point out of your blog and I have it on your post -it, in my post-it here. Um, how far do you go with async? Because how far you go with it will depend really on your appetite for change. Uh, so I want to dive a little bit here, Sumit, into the appetite for change. How do you how do you figure out, you know, what's the appetite of change? Because I want to make this question broader later in terms of organizations. But for now, let's just stick to the team's appetite for change. Yeah, so I generally recommend that you start by examining what value do you want from any change, whether it's async or whether it's something else, right? So I talked about a few benefits at the start of this conversation. So there's deep work, there's work-life balance, diversity and inclusion, bias for action, uh, optimizing for scale, knowledge sharing, and all of that, right? Now, you need to spend some time introspecting as a team as to which of those benefits shout out to you as the benefits that make sense for your team. Right. That itself, right. to a great extent, defines what that appetite is, right? The other thing is no change happens overnight. So based on the value that you're seeking, you will probably prioritize certain practices over the others. And so you've got to ask yourself, which are those practices? Because again, a very generic high level approach of saying no meetings from tomorrow does not work. Mm -hmm. And so uh, James Stanier, he was one of the reviewers for my book as well. Uh, he's written a book called Effective Remote Work. And in his book, he recommends what he says is the spectrum of synchronousness, where on the right hand side, you can imagine a fully synchronous process. Everyone always has to be on Zoom calls and Slack chats, right? And on the left, you have fully asynchronous. Everything always happens on a wiki, right? Neither of these extremes is productive. Mm. But what he does say is that the world of knowledge work is too far indexed on the right hand side of the spectrum where you're doing too much synchronous work. And so for every interaction, every bit of collaboration that you do, you ask yourself the question of, can I shift left a little? Mm. Right. So if I was doing a synchronous call, which is on Zoom, could that be replaced by a chat? If I was doing a chat back and forth for the 
previous five hours, could that have been replaced by a well-written email? Mm. Instead of an email, could I create something more persistent, like a shared document, which people can put in comments to, reactions, and I can improve that document as I get feedback? And even more persistent than a document, can I consider something slightly more permanent, which is a team handbook that sits on a wiki? Can you see, with each of these, it's just a simple consideration based on that particular you know, style of collaboration, and you're asking yourself the question of, can I shift left a little? And yeah. that's what I mean by appetite, right? And I love that because it's it's so different for every team, right? Like, you know, every individual is different. So their preferences are going to be different. You know, perspectives are different. Preferences are different. How much I want to shift left is so dependent on me as an individual plus me as a team. So yeah. it would be so different for everybody. One team might just say, hey, let's, you know, let's do this whole big bang approach. Let's go all left. And the other would say, I'm a little skeptical. No, let's just try this one notch forward and let's experiment a little. Let's figure it out. So I love this approach. Yeah, yeah. And, and the other thing to also consider is that teams don't exist in their own isolated bubbles. There's yeah. a lot of interdependencies, right? So teams often have to collaborate with other teams. And that might impede how much change you're able to make. You also cannot just say, well, we're going to stop the line for the next two months because we are going async. You still have to keep delivering. Now, how much of a productivity hit can you take? How much is that is the business affording you? That's also going to be a question for your appetite for change. So some of these decisions of how much change you go through in a, in a given period of time is that notion of appetite. Right. Oh, I love this conversation so far. I'm just doing a quick check on time. I think we're still good. Uh, we can still do another few minutes. So let's keep going. Um, this gets me actually into the broader question of a lot of organizations, as you and I are both seeing today, are, you know, bringing all employees back to office, um, yeah. struggling in many ways, of course, you know, three days, two days, five days, four days, a lot of the struggles that I, yeah, I don't need to really be explicit about it. We all know what's happening in different parts of the globe. What what from this whole async piece can can you provide to these organizations as alternative strategies that they could perhaps, I don't know, consider rather than just, you know, forcing people to come back to office? Yeah. So, so let's unpack this a little bit because I think there are three parts to the question. One is I uh, I talk about async in the context of remote work where it's most useful, mm -hmm. but that doesn't mean that if everyone is in the office, now you're all going nuts, tapping each other on the shoulder, right? So even when you're in the office, always reaching out for a synchronous conversation isn't the best idea because as we talked about earlier, every interruption is basically a loss of 20 odd minutes. Right. And that adds up. So you should be considering how you can be a little more asynchronous, even if your work requires you to be in an office. And sometimes the reasons are very genuine. So there might be regulatory requirements, uh, which were relaxed during the pandemic, but they don't go away all of a sudden. The world changes a little bit at a time. So sometimes those are genuine concerns. Right now, of course, and also Companies' IT infrastructure needs to mature where you say, all right, uh, I'm implementing this perimeterless security. I'm implementing a zero trust policy when it comes to the usage of my devices and my networks, right? And that takes time because it's a high level of tech maturity and tools maturity that you need to get to. So understandably, every organization is not going to be ready for remote all the time. Right. Right. So. That brings me to the second part of the question, which is that while I am a big proponent of remote work, and I believe it's not just good for the people, it's also good for profits because it brings down your operating costs. And uh, we've seen this during the pandemic. There's some data around this as well. Pollution goes down because people are not commuting that much. It's good for the planet as well, right? Having said that, it would be intellectually dishonest of me to say that remote work is for every company, 
right? right. And uh, the, the reason is that we have a very ideal conception of remote work. And that ideal conception comes from the many remote native companies that were remote even before the pandemic. Right. So people look at GitLab, they look at 37 signals, they look at Todoist and say, oh, wow, that's that's what the paragon of remote work looks like. And therefore, remote work is great. And yes, it is. But when you don't do remote work well, there are a number of side effects. So, for example, look, you and I, before we got onto this call, we've actually met as individuals in a coffee shop. We've had a really nice chat. And back in the day when people used to go into the office, we used to be afforded a few conversations with each other over lunch, uh, you know, just stepping out, even gossiping at the table, whether that was productive or not. It helped you see the other person as an as a human being. Sure. Right. Now, what happens at scale when you cannot identify the other person as a distinct, unique individual is you get into the phenomenon of alienation. Now, Sarika is not just another human being. She's employee number 11984, who's a resource who needs to be utilized. Right. So that's a problem. There's uh, there's also biases. Uh, there's some very interesting research out there, and the world is not getting over these biases very soon. We've gotten very good at including certain historically disadvantaged, historically underrepresented minorities in the workplace. Mm -hmm. So women's representation in IT is improving. So today, if a woman coworker comes and says, well, I need to work remotely, because I am a mother, I've got to take care of my family. We are a lot more open to that idea. But I am a single parent as well. And my daughter completely relies on me. Uh, if I go and have that same conversation, I'm going to be met with bias, which is to say, hey, but you're a man, right? What do you have to do? And there is research. It's not just my anecdotal story, right? There's research to say that men face biases when looking at remote work to satisfy their household responsibilities, right? So we are not going to get it away from that. The other is that organizing becomes very difficult. When I say organizing, everyone is separate, right? Everyone is by themselves. So to a great extent, employees are like glorified freelancers. Now, let's say a well-intentioned company puts out a poorly crafted policy. There is no collective front that employees can put together because they've not had the opportunity to organize. Mm. In theory, you can, but for that you need platforms, right? And most companies don't have the platforms for people to organize virtually, right? We don't have a Twitter equivalent or a Facebook equivalent inside a company, inside most companies, some companies do where they can organize. And even there, there are restrictions. But if you were in an office and you were dissatisfied with the policy that was rolled out, you could talk to somebody and then talk to somebody else and talk to somebody else in a very short period of time. And you would know that there are 50 other people who are just as disgruntled as you and you could put out a common face, right? Mm -hmm. A common front. Uh, exploitation becomes a big problem with remote work. So think about it this way. I mean, uh, you've probably heard the, the uh, Listeners abroad may not know Narayan Murthy. He's uh, one of the founders of one of our biggest tech firms in India, right? He just recently said, well, everyone should work 70 hours. And uh, on the back of that, a few startup founders went and said, yes, of course, 70 hours. You shouldn't be expecting any work-life balance if you work for a startup. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. guess what happens with remote work? You are at work all day because your office is right here. My office is in the house. So you can be exploited to kingdom come, right? So exploitation is a problem. Now, size is a, uh, creates a paradox. The bigger companies can put in better systems and they probably have a brand to live up to. They can't exploit their company, their employees too much. But they are the companies that are actually calling people into the office. The smaller companies are being a little more permissive and saying, yeah, work from home. But they are also not the companies that will think too much about their brand, about their practices and stuff like that, right? And last but not the least, if we've talked about this, right? If your practices are dysfunctional, then remote work just makes things harder because you're constantly in meetings, constantly in Slack chats, you have 
uh, you're having to do your actual work in a second shift, you're burning yourself out. So this long winded diatribe that I had was just to say that we can't have this, this very ideal notion of what remote work is, there is a practicality to, you know, how many companies practice remote work. Now, from the employees perspective, here's the, here's the, the fun part, which is people value the lack of commute and the time that they get back with families so much that they're willing to look beyond all of the ills that I've spoken about till now. Mm. So that tilts the scale, which is not to say that remote work in those situations is actually better than going to the office. Right. Right. And so that's the second part of the unpacking. The first part was, uh, yeah. And the third part is uh, async. And I think async, uh, the pushback or whatever it might be, right? So is it for everyone? Is it is there a pushback? There are pushbacks on various different fronts. One is that the pushback comes from this linkage to remote. Mm -hmm. And so we've addressed that already. It doesn't have to be linked to remote. Uh, a lot of people are going remote. A lot of companies are going remote because they see another company which either looks like them or they aspire to be going remote. And they're like, oh, I used to idealize, idealize Jeff Bezos. Jeff Bezos has called everyone back into the office, so I should do the same, right? And so that'll happen as well. So that's one of the other pushbacks because you say remote equals async and I'm not remote, hence no async. Right. And then of right. course, uh, there is a pushback because there's a reluctance to dive into the detail of practices. You can't just delete meetings on day one and say we are done. And a lot of teams don't have the space to do that. Yeah. So that'll also be one of those pushbacks that you will see. Sorry, that's a very long winded answer to what I thought, what you might have thought is a very straightforward question. I didn't really think it was a straightforward question because it had multiple questions in it, but it was a fantastic answer. I think I like the layers that you opened up. It was literally opening up the layers of the onion. So fantastic. Thank you so much. I'm hoping that, yeah, people, people find good insights from, you know, from these responses that, you know, or this conversation that we've been having and look at their context and see whether this makes sense for them, whether they can move a little bit left, because I think that's the mindset that I would hope somebody can take back, especially from this conversation. Because yes, we're going to be all in different contexts. There is no silver bullet, but how much can I move on this spectrum to grab as much of the, or reap as many benefits from the async journey that I can, whether that means applying it to your own personal life or, you know, or your own way of remote working and seeing how much of async can you build in intentionally or whether that means helping your organization do that because I guess everybody needs help and sometimes people just need the nudge or the trigger to get in somewhere. Yeah, if I if I could just a, a minute or two uh, is Please. one way to look at it is that regardless of everything that I've said about remote work, most people prefer to work remotely most days of the week. That's just a fact. You can look at survey after survey after survey, and that's just a fact. Now, what we know about knowledge work is that people matter the most, right? This is something Martin Fowler has said. This is something Jim Highsmith has said. Every titan of the agile verse that you talk to, they will say the same thing. Now, if people matter most and people prefer to work remotely most of the time, as a leader, you're probably in a good place to think that you should architect your organization and your team to be as remote first as possible. And if you're trying to be remote first, going async first is a natural progression and you should embrace that. And for the individual, it's, uh, you know, the way to think about this is this will build a number of skills for you. You will get a lot more work done because you're going to build those deep work skills that will position you even better for the materialistic things in uh, a job, right? You, you're a better place for a promotion, for a raise and all of that stuff. It'll help you build your writing skills, right? And because over time, you're gonna 
writing just helps you create assets, right? There are going to be so many of these assets that are against your name. Sarika created this, Sarika created that, and Sarika created that too, that you also start to build your personal brand. So there's a lot to be gained from choosing this way of working, aside from work-life balance and all of that stuff as well. So I think there is something in it for all parties involved. The question is, when do you brew that perfect storm where you make a big fly because it sits in the center of that whirlwind? Right. Awesome. Now, this is really good. Um, I know we are, we've, we've shot over the time we agreed, <laughs> but I still want to have uh, at least one other question so we can wrap it up with that. Um, yeah, let me put it this way. So if you had to leave a couple of, uh, no, if you had to leave an advice or so for people, you know, wanting to jump on the async journey tomorrow and try something out, maybe as a leader, maybe as a change agent, maybe as just a remote worker, it doesn't matter who, but what would you, or where would you say they should start? Can we guide them to a starting point? Yeah, I would say start with cultivating the fundamental skills because those are not going anywhere. Regardless of your way of working, these are valuable skills. So reading and writing these are skills that almost seem like they're going extinct and i'm concerned about them because there's no way you can have a a prolific tech career if you're not willing to write and read so that's one blocking distractions is a very important skill it'll just enhance your productivity to a point that you can't imagine right so that's the place which i would expect individuals to start from and what I would say to leaders is to take a step back, look at your processes and uh, discard your status quo bias because it's like we've done this this way all the time, right? That's the status quo bias. Shed that status quo bias for a second and say, if you are working in a distributed fashion, now your medium of work is not an office. Your medium of work is the internet. And if you had to set up a practice from scratch, how would you do it? Forget about what you did in the past. And what you will notice is that many practices are highly inefficient because you paste an office model onto a completely new medium. Mm -hmm. And that will give you the critical thinking to nudge you in the right direction. Now, whether that is being more async, being more inclusive, that's a call that you make based on your context, right? But inclusion first, async first is probably going to be the direction where that thought process will lead you. Fantastic advice. So to all our listeners and viewers, our leaders, team members, and whoever else is interested in going async, please do delve into that advice right now that Sumit has just shared. So please take a note. And yes, uh, I think I'd like to thank you, Sumit, uh, for being on this podcast with me today. Uh, it's been a delightful conversation. And I think as we've spoken already, we are going to not just bring you in today, but also on some other perhaps roundtable conversations and back to your book too, once I've had a chance of reading it completely, of course. Sure, sure, sure. Awesome. So back to our listeners and viewers. Thank you all for listening and viewing our podcast today. And we will see you another time yet again with an awesome speaker and an awesome topic. And last but not the least, don't forget, if you have any questions, Sumit and I are both here to respond to them. Do write back. You have my email right in the show notes below. And Sumit, if people want to reach out directly to you, do you want to share where, how can they reach out to you? Well, just find me on LinkedIn. You can search for my name and it's unique enough that you'll find me. And then if you want to follow my writing, you can go to asyncagile.org. And that's where I write pretty much every week. Um, anything that you want to find uh, there. And there's a contact form there where you can reach out to me as well. And just in case you feel like looking at my photography, you can just go to my first name, last name dot com, which is sumitmoge.com. Awesome. Yes. Uh, so we will make sure that we have your contact details also in our description below of this video. So yes, you can reach out to Sumit directly too. And remember, we are not robots yet. So do reach out. We're just human. 
Um, yeah. But thank you once again, Sumit, and I will see you all next time. Bye for now. My pleasure. Bye.